All right. It looks like I see some of you guys in the chat. Um, I see the mods are already dropping a link for Expendables. Go to hell in, in the chat as well, and it's in the description in case you are confused and wondering who I am. My name is Antonio Bryce. I'm a comic book writer. I am the creator of the comic book series Brand and its upcoming sequel, Brand Way of the Gun, which will be launching at the end of the month. The, the link to the, the pre-launch page on Indiegogo is in the description for that as well. Um, we are waiting on your boy, Zach. I just got confirmation he is on his way to the stream. But while we wait on your boy, Zach, I am going to take a few moments and interview uh, a true legend in this business. Uh, this is literally the man that broke the bat. Uh, oh, I'm so excited. Ladies and gentlemen, Chuck Dixon is here with us. How are you, Chuck? I'm just fine. Hello to all of you geeks and geekettes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, my goodness. Chuck, it is, uh, you know, I have uh, such a fondness for your work. I've been reading it for over three decades. And, uh, you know, you are a true legend in this business. You know, I was looking over one thing. I have the collected uh, graphic novel of Team Seven, and that was always. I got to be honest. A lot of that old image stuff doesn't hold up. Hmm. Um, it was a lot of pretty pictures. Yes. What uh, yeah, but Team Seven. How did how did you get on Team Seven? Because I remember you Punisher like Punisher War Journal and stuff like that. And how did you get on Team Seven? I think Jim, Jim Lee suggested me because they wanted a military thing with some sort of believability, and they knew I would do the homework. They knew I'd uh, get the weapons right and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, they brought me on. Well, let me uh, have you. Have you? Did you, you actually serve in the military, or you just? Uh, no, I just. I, I just love reading about this stuff. Uh, always have. You know, my dad and all of his friends were World War II vets, and I used to sit and listen to them when they, you know you know, get drunk on the stoop and start talking about war stories and uh, just sort of grew up around it and, uh, you know, just constantly reading about this stuff. So and talks, I've talked a lot. I, I'm, I'm terrible at pestering vets with questions. Even well, yeah, today, my, my, yeah, even my, today my dad. young guys come that are back from Iran and Afghanistan when they come to a show or a store appearance, I'm, I'm the one asking all the questions. <laughs> I know that because I know uh, Billy. Billy's always uh, showing like different planes from uh, uh, World War Two and all that kind of stuff. Hold on, let me let me tag Richard in. He is here. Your boy Zach. Bam. How are you doing, Zach? Good. Thanks. All right. Thank you for being here. But but Chuck, like you said, Team Seven. Love that. And you also wrote uh, when uh, the the Robin miniseries. What was it, with Tom with the late Tom Lyle, which unfortunately we lost in uh, November of last year. But uh, that that first Robin miniseries was incredible. You introduced King Snake, who I did not know was the father of Bane, which you also created. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was was that your idea to make them father and son, or was that some some other writer's idea? No, no, that was my idea initially. Okay. Uh, you know, and then we sort of played around and uh, kept it in the background of the continuity of the mystery of Bane's father. Who is it? So. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was like I love King Snake. I just I don't think that he has any. As a matter of fact, I, isn't he dead now? I don't know. But he, yeah, I, yeah, he's gone. yeah that's why I was like, man, especially in the first miniseries, I thought he was incredible. He was such a, you know, he was one of my favorites, and and you know, you just seem to be really good at handling those kind of uh, stories, that kind of character building. The I always felt like your characters were were real characters, especially like when they had any kind of military stuff, you were just dead on with that kind of stuff. And uh, that's, that's why I was very happy when, when, when Zach said that you were doing uh jawbreakers, God King, that you were, you were writing some of that and uh, the, with the devil dog uh, story. Yeah, and, that was fun stuff. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Well, it, I've seen a lot of reviews on it and people loved uh, Jawbreakers, uh, God King, and I, I had book one, and I definitely had to buy book two, and I bought this Expendables. Just hearing that Chuck Dixon, I was like, this, you know, it's got a couple people that that uh, I I really admire in in this business. Obviously, uh, uh, you, Mister Zach, uh, love your work. 
So I was very happy to support. I love, love, love Kelsey Shannon. He is dear, dear to my heart. Uh, you know, Billy Tucci on the cover. Love Billy. Uh, you know, so there was there's so many, you know, you know, this is it just seemed like I was like, OK, but how did this how did jaw uh, how did uh, the expendables? How did this all happen? Uh, Zach and Chuck. I mean, I don't I mean, obviously, you guys have collaborated before, but I know. Chuck, you did the Expendables, the one, the one that was at uh, Dynamite, right? Yeah, I did. A, I did an Expendables prequel to the first film for Dynamite, and um, uh, Stallone contacted me after it came out, and he told me how much he liked it and how mm. I got the characters and I understood the the pr particular uh, shorthand that his characters talked in. You know, like I, I, I just, you know, grooved into that. And uh, he wanted to know if I wanted to come out and uh, work on Expendables 2. Uh, yes. Yes, so please. Said, yeah, you know, <laughs> but you know, it didn't work out. They, they, the production company wasn't going to offer me enough money. But um, the best part of it was is that, you know, Sly kept calling me uh, for different things. And he would call and bounce ideas off me and stuff like that. And we were talking about, I think it was Expendables 4. He was thinking of ideas. And he told me about this crazy idea he had for a movie where the Expendables go to hell, you know. And he said, "But you know, nobody will ever green like that." And so I said, "You know, that'd make a great comic book." And um, it, it took a while until I just made the connection that you know Richard is such a huge Expendables fan, probably the biggest Expendables fan I've ever met. Yes. So I got I I, I told Sly, I said, "There's this guy that could put this together for us, and it will be awesome." And, uh, you know, he gave me permission to talk to Richard about it. And I called Richard and I said, you know, sit down. You want to be sitting when I tell you this. <laughs> and I told him the, the whole concept. And by the end of the week, we were already working on it. I'd written pages. And I, think, I think we actually had art within like three or four days. Well, yeah. What, what about you, Richard? Tell me, uh, you know, obviously I, I know you are an admirer as I am of, of uh, Chuck Dixon, but uh, I, surely – you didn't dream that this would happen, did you? <laughs> no. Um, I, I mean, I was I I was interested in it, um, but the last I knew, the rights were held by you know the previous uh, company that published it. So, and then we tried to get another character who, even though they're in the public domain, it's still you know it's kind of dicey to to do that. So, uh, we tried to get John Carter. Uh, spent about a month of emails trying to get that, and it it didn't happen. And then, geez, like, I don't know, three hours later, Chuck, uh, you know, sent me an email and then we ended up talking and uh, he said the Expendables, but my brain translated it as something like the Expendables. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like <laughs> so a knockoff team. Yeah. I was excited. I was still bummed about John Carter. So this, this, it felt like a consolation prize. He's <laughs> like, I got this idea, this kind of, and I go, yeah, uh, yeah, let's talk about your idea like the Expendables. He's like, it's it's not like it. It's the Expendables, um, and then <laughs> the uh, actual Expendables. Yeah. Yeah. So like you know in the movies where the person's like hearing kind of goes out and everything gets a little fuzzy. Uh, yeah. That's uh, the rest of the conversation was kind of like that. <laughs> so he told me basically what he he told you right there, and then I mean there was no there was no hesitation. Uh, it was a very quick turnaround. It was just you know basic agreements on on what we're gonna do with everyone and it was just hit the ground running we actually did this uh uh in little groups of i don't know like five pages at a time because mm. nobody wanted to wait for the whole script to be done it's just you know w w don't worry this ladder goes somewhere just start climbing the rungs uh and uh yeah so i think graham signed on like the next day and yeah. then the promo image that we use all the time that was the first thing he drew uh and then just and it was awesome. straight into it yeah. Well, uh, Richard, I, you've, I, I've told you, you know, I've, I, I know I, I pester you all the time showing you my horrible comic book art, but uh, you've always been very kind when I do so. So I, I thank you. I don't take that for granted because uh, I know you're a busy man, but uh, I've tried to follow, especially with uh, preparing for brand way of the gun, try to follow your crowdfunding model. Cause I know that first time you actually needed capital with jawbreakers and what, over four hundred thousand dollars raised, which was amazing, and then you you had Iron Sights, and I know you did about one hundred thirty thousand on that one as well. Which Iron Sights two is another success, and 
Jaw Braves God King. Everything you've touched, I mean, you've raised over a million dollars on Indiegogo, which is amazing. Um, but you were showing me about, hey, once you get the money, set some of it aside and start going into production on the next book. Yeah. <laughs> so that is something that Kanan and I, I mean, we're like, we're like 12 pages in now. And I'm like, thank God, because I crowdfunded brand. And then he wasn't, he was under contract to Stranger Comics and he didn't get to start on it for like six months. So that, that kind of sucked. And, you know, it's like, I wish if he had been able to start on it when I launched the campaign outside of doing some promo pieces, I think we, you know, f finally the book is in the chat. Oh, I see Ethan Van Skyver's in the chat. Hello, Ethan. And, uh, you know, thank you for being here. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, um, I, I definitely credit you for that because I was like, when we do the next book, I want to be ahead of the curve. I don't want to be behind. We're playing catch up the whole time because we didn't have any money. Kanan had to keep working. He was doing stuff for Zenoscope and all this. You know, everybody's like, forgets the guy's married and got four kids. And so he's got to keep working. And I didn't have any money to pay him to do anything. So I understood. And then by the time I got the money, you know, it's almost six months later. But I mean, obviously, we finished the book. It's all colored and it's at the printers as of yesterday. And um, I, but it definitely wanted to thank you and credit you because you've uh, I, I've tried to follow your uh, your your uh, example, because I know a lot of times when you launch your books are at least 60, 70 percent done. It sounds like uh, Expendables. Uh, you guys are at least halfway there or no? How, how far yeah, are you? On? I'd say for the entire project, probably about 55 to 60 percent done right now. Mm. Good. Yeah, we had to keep it a secret for a long time. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, I actually managed to hear the secret uh, last year, and I was so happy that no one leaked it because this was one of the few times I was like, man, this can be special. I hope everybody keeps their mouth shut. And then when, when the Indiegogo launched, Oh my God! Everybody seemed like they lost their minds. They thought it was. They was like, "It's not really Expendables, is it?" No, <laughs> it's really Expendables, and it was like. And then, then they were like, "Well, so Sylvester Stallone hasn't said anything about the project, so I don't think this is real." And then Sylvester tweeted out that, "Hey," and he started tweeting the images out. <laughs> then they really got mad, and I saw some people got mad at at, at Sylvester talking about. Why would he work with Richard Meyer? Why would he do this? And why would he do, you know all this kind of thing? People really went insane. But I am so happy. The book is over ninety three thousand. You're going to crack most likely by this weekend. You're going to be over a hundred thousand. I saw all twenty five signed editions that uh, Sylvester Stallone was, is doing. Doing them at a thousand a pop. You sold them all. What in less than twenty four hours? You just skip. I mean, Richard, how does that make you feel when the community just comes and supports your projects like this? Well, it's it's just like uh, the funny thing is that you know we we worked on it for six months and 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 we kept it secret so that it would make a huge splash, and people say like uh, that it must have felt like a dream. I mean, it was very exciting in the beginning, and then it was just work. It, <laughs> it, 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 I liked it, but it, it was work, and I was excited. But it feels like a dream now. Like this is the part that feels fake when it's like you know everyone. Uh, <laughs> is buying it um, because, you know, you look at stuff and, and there was demand. People were saying, uh, I, when I first launched it uh, well, a couple of days ago, it put, you know, I, I've done sign on all my projects. I kind of varied the signing thing, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, sign everything or just it's, a, you have to pay more to get it signed and I've switched back and forth. So this one I did, uh, you know, signed copy, but the price was very reasonable. So I was like, I didn't think anyone would think that that was the Stallone signed copy. And then people are like, oh, oh am I getting the Stallone? I was like, no, no. It doesn't matter what you put, everybody. You can't get like Ricky Schroeder's signature for the amount of money I charge for my signature. <laughs> oh, man, um, yes. So there was some confusion. I ended up taking that one down. Um, and then uh, I didn't, people were asking me, they're like, oh, can you do this? I was like, well, you know, he's the boss. I don't ask him for stuff. If he wants to do something, he'll do it. Um, uh, so uh, so uh, uh, Chuck went to him and he's like, you know, I can do 25. And um, I, I don't really know about the autograph uh, market. I know Ethan is very active into it. They have these, I think they're called fan cons and they're basically autograph conventions. 
but I knew it was a huge market. So I did some research and it was like seven years ago, he did a convention and it was like $400 for his signature because he doesn't do it a lot, you know? Well, you know, he, not um, the guy, he doesn't go to the steakhouse and sign five of them on the way in and way out. You know, he's a busy guy. He's been dealing with this for 40 years. So, he, you know, he's time and place. So, um, you know, s scarcity gives things value. He doesn't do it a lot. So it's actually out there. Now, I knew it was going to do good. I mean, this is a living legend. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, 16 hours. I thought a couple days. I thought we'd sell a bunch in one day and then, you know, it, we'd, we'd, we'd have to go. I might have to go post on some of these fan sites. No, it was, first of all, the craziest thing is I, I launched it and two immediately sold within minutes, which tells me. I know there was Ethan said people. he was one of them. Yeah, Ethan bought one. He, I think he was a third. There were two yeah. people just hit and refresh all day long. <laughs> they just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Waiting for that thing to go live because I'm talking minutes, two or three minutes. We sold two of them, and then um, I, I then I did a post like an hour later. We already had five, and then it was just boom. And I and I use this this phrase, you know, don't sleep on it. But I was being literal. Don't yeah. go to sleep. When you wake up, it will be gone. And I believe there were six left when I woke up, and then They're by lunchtime, yeah. sixteen hours. Yeah, well, when I, I approached Sly about it, I was like, you know, would you would you entertain the idea of signing some copies? And I said, I promise, I promise, I promise, we will not be pestering you for the next 30 days for favors. But this just seems like low-hanging fruit. And he said, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And I'm like, well, how many? And he says, 25. Boom. And there we go. And we've already sold them all. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, they're all gone. Yeah, <laughs> they are all gone. I'm, I'm it was sorry. Been 24 guys. hours of him saying yes, I'll do. You know, I'll sign 25. They're gone. Well, yeah. Well, let me let me get this super chat. I've got Charlie's London uh, for four dollars and ninety nine pounds, I guess, or four four ninety nine in pounds sterling. However, they do that. But hey, guys, do you have a uh, have you uh, have a way someone can contact you for advice about handling a registered IP? I've landed a registered IP, and your advice would be gold. So I know Zach. I know you might have a few ideas about that. Uh, if you could help Miss Charlie. I don't, I'm kind of blanking. I, as soon as I got out of tech, I just, my brain lost everything. How I dare spent, you, Zach? I You're spent an it. hour trying to, to troubleshoot sluggish internet this morning and I was just <laughs> Googling it like everyone else. Yeah, that that's a very fast moving industry and I've been out for a year and a half. <laughs> She's talking about an IP. I mean, does that mean a copyrighted? Oh, what? I was thinking IP address. I'm oh sorry. no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what she thought. She's. Talking I thought about, you yeah. were using me as tech support. Sorry. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> property. She wants to know where how to proceed. I'm not sure what that means, but. Oh, so like if you've got some sort of license for something, like you got whatever, Thunder the Barbarian. I um, mean, you know, I'd, I'd I'd start. Yeah, I'd love to get Thunder the Barbarian as well. Didn't Jack um, Kirby him? I think. Yeah, I didn't. He designed yeah. a bunch of those Hanna Barbera characters. Yeah. That, Kirby, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, my advice is just find some people. So, one of the things is, you know, uh, the enthusiasm is going to sell your stuff. And I think one of the things is we got somebody who's, you know, crucial to the franchise, Chuck, and then a super fan. I just sent uh, Chuck a picture. I've had the uh, official uh, Lee Christmas throwing knives in my car for 10 <laughs> years. Mm. Um, uh, I bought them. I thought they were going to be like just something to put on a wall, but then they're actually weighted throwing knives. And I got into throwing knives. Like I'm a super fan. Um, uh, actually, <laughs> I think Salome should be worried. She'll probably have me on a list somewhere. Like I, I always say, you're not supposed to be as into the expendables as I am. Like to me, it's the godfather. And initially in the project, I was trying to steer it. And then uh, Chuck was like, yeah, I, I've written a comic or two. Trust me, I can do this. Like, so we kind of we kind of split things where I, I gave some like uh, some like uh, fan advice, like, wouldn't it be cool if? And then I did like these little side quests, I call them. Ooh, okay. Well, Charlie London just sent another super chat for one pound ninety nine cents. Uh, however, that works again. But she's saying it's Charlie Chaplin is the IP that she got the rights to. That's interesting. 
Uh, Charlie true. Chaplin. She's got like the comic book rights to Charlie Chaplin. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would would Chuck Dixon be wanting to write that? I'm not a chat. If she got Buster Keaton, I'd be jumping up and down. I'm not a big huh. Chaplin fan, but that's an incredible property. Yeah, so that is national appeal. You you could do some awesome comics with that. Ooh, I'm, yeah, I'm curious how that. Uh, who the, the, the thing is that that you know Richard was saying about he tried to steer the story, but but he did contribute to me the heart of the story uh, because, you know, he got into, you know, he told me rewatch Expendables 2 and I want to deal with Billy uh, in hell. And I'm like, okay, you know, and then he, he talked a little bit more about it. And I, I saw what he was talking about, you know, that, that the, the story of Barney and Billy re-meeting in hell was really the spine of the whole graphic novel. Mm. So one of the things I like about the Expendables, besides it, that it reminds me of, you know, the camaraderie of being in, in an infantry squad, is that it's, you know, it, it's big action, it's popcorn, but like in each movie, there will be one scene that's like this complete emotional gut punch that you are yeah. not expecting, because it's just like macho banter, and then it'll kind of build to that, and then each, all three of the movies have this like very emotional chord in them. Um, much more than other action movies ever do. Usually they do this thing I call micro grief. Oh, this guy's a firefighter. His wife was killed. Now he's getting on adventures. But like five minutes later, he's kind of fine, you know? He's yeah, driving yeah. around in a sports <laughs> car, looking cool. Like he should just be crying all the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, so so you, you see him kind of like carry it. And, 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 and Barney Ross is kind of a very rich character. He only kind of gets so hop so happy like when everyone else is happy he's kind of got like this cloud over him you know because he's just dealt with this stuff his whole life hmm. interesting you, it, you just make it like i said i've seen i've seen the expendable movies especially what was that one uh it, you know john claude van damme was in. i mean he's had so many but like bruce willis and arnold Schwarzenegger. i just it always fascinated me um and i i, I noticed one thing after you launched a lot of people mentioned that terry cruz's character wasn't part of this particular story is there a reason for that or yeah so like i said i'm such I, i've never set up google alerts but literally for the last 10 years every couple of months i'll just type expendables see what's happening with sequels and uh terry cruz has basically said he wants to move on with his career um and he basically doesn't want to be involved with the expendables franchise so out of respect to that wish you know we kept him out okay i, I get that let me see um interesting question here for you guys uh how about a demolition man? I always love demolition man is a favorite of mine. It's Stallone and and, and uh, Wesley Snipes. I love Simon Phoenix as a villain. I, I just thought uh, Snipes was in his element there. I would Chuck. I know you would kill that. I know you would kill you. Yeah, right, well, demolition man would be great. Yeah, unfortunately, we'd have to deal with the studios, uh, uh -huh. which okay. we didn't have to do this time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I yeah, I I climb all over that there's there's not you know you know i i, I think any sly movie I, i'd take a shot at oh yeah i was like uh what was that? Hold on. Let's see, that, that would be good stuff because that was a fun movie yeah it's, it's still a favorite uh zay comments i see you sent five dollars but i don't have a question attached uh uh just at, at me and if you have a question for for chuck and zach i will be more than happy to ask it but i thank you for the uh five uh but let me see here is a comment oh okay i see he's got a comment here he said excited for the tool story he's my favorite this project inspired me to write my own tool in hell story hope i can do something with it one day and i know that uh Zay Comics is the Diaz brothers. They have a book called Magic Cop that is on Indiegogo right now. It is still funding. Uh, matter of fact, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, the, uh, one of the Diaz brothers could drop that link in the chat for the people. We have uh, 108 people watching right now, and it seems like it's climbing. You guys, people like you guys for some reason. Uh, but Chuck, let me ask you. Obviously, you guys, you you and Richard have uh, seemed to have a good uh, working relationship. Um, what what is it about your boy Zach that draws you to him that makes you? Because I, I I know he respects you as well. Well, I mean, it began you know when he started doing the videos, and I, you know I watched a bunch, and uh, I thought this guy is saying something that the comics world needs to hear. And apparently they responded because, you know, I would look at the, the numbers of people watching these videos. I'm like, 
and this is a groundswell. There's more people li watching this guy's videos than read comics. And these are all people that are, have left <laughs> comics. That is true. And will come back and listen to this guy talk about them. You know, so I'm like, there's this huge untapped audience that this guy, is, you know, has as a listenership. And uh, that's obvious from the success he's had in crowdfunding. You know, they're responding, you know, you know, he's basically trying to deliver the kind of comics that people used to like. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know, I, I think I reached out early on and said, if there's anything I can ever do to help you. And I didn't mean right, or I'm not looking for a job or anything like that, but you're, you're like the beginning of a movement. And I, wanna, I, want, I want you to know that I support it and anything, any help you need, you know, I got your back. And, uh, you know, that's where it began. And then, you know, he reached out to me to, to write a couple of things. And, you know, we had a great relationship, a very creative relationship, mostly because he just leaves me alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one thing I've noticed about, about Zach. He just kind of, I, I noticed with the people that he collaborates with, I've, I, I've heard John Malin talk about how easy it was to do Jawbreakers Lost Souls with him. And it was just the, the collaboration. Everybody on that team just seemed to love working on the book. And obviously I was a backer on that. It, it, it book turned out beautifully. It was a great project and obviously very successful. And, uh, you know, you got Aaron Alfecci and, you know, I, he seems very happy to be working with, you know, it's like, uh, I've heard, had Ebi Canales on this channel a few times and he loves working. He, he can't wait to do another Ironside. He's like, Oh yeah, we're doing another one. And I was like, okay. So, uh, I, I know that has to humble you, Zach, to, you know, that people just seem to love you. You know, I was telling you that earlier. I don't think you realize how many people love you and love working with you. Well, yeah, it, it's been really great, you know, working with everyone. And uh, I remember originally, especially since for the last 10 years in comics, it's all about, you know, give someone three months of work and then they disappear because they don't want anyone to have any power. They're afraid of image revolution happening again. So no matter how good someone is, like the max they'll give you is like, six to nine issues and then they'll shuffle you off for you know to you know basically you know not let not let you grow but uh, so i kind of like subconsciously absorbed that when i would work with someone i just assumed it was the only time and i was like man this sucks i'm gonna have to find like six people every three months for a whole new crew and then i was like wait why you know if if yeah. everything's good and we want to work together let's just keep working together over and over and over again yeah. And even with an abai, I said, you know, we're gonna we're gonna you know keep doing iron sights till you know till the wheels fall off. I have an actual number, which is, you know, <laughs> that's the wheels falling off. But <laughs> it, it, when that happens, we'll stop doing iron sights, but we'll just do some something else. Let's just keep doing stuff. So the the biggest uh, learning experience I had was just learning just to back off and trust people. Um, and sometimes I try to do like a mix and like it's just best. It's just better to just be like either it's like 100% theirs, you know, or it's like, hey, wouldn't it be cool? That's better. Instead of trying to be a backside, backseat driver, just do a, wouldn't it be cool? And um, one of the things I, I mean, I love Chuck's stuff. I love this since, you know, Punisher, uh, Warzone, and Team 7 is, is huge to me. Um, is just, just let him do his thing, you know? And uh, uh, he, he takes things and he makes them better. Like I had, we have a book that still hasn't come out yet. But I had this very esoteric, like motivation for a character. He's and then he's like, his daughter get killed. He wants revenge. And I go, what about the philosophy of the future Earth? And he's like, his daughter got killed. <laughs> he wants revenge. Like he made it like straightforward, primal, understandable, and it's gonna make the story better. I remember when I I handed in Devil Dog, and you and you said, well, I might want to make a few changes. And then like an hour later, you send me another message. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's perfect the way it is. Mm. Well, you just look at it and you're, you're, you're just like, I'm, number one, you've been doing comics 30, 40 years longer than I have. But also it's just like, it's like, why would you hire someone and then try to water it down? Why would you, you know, try to have a different flavor? Because, I mean, one of the things I find is even just like rewording a caption, like it shows. So yeah, you're, you're not going to hit. Sometimes you want to make a point. You're like, it's better just to, I, I think the only thing I did is I asked to take a couple things out, yeah. um, but it wasn't a change or an ad. Right. Um, it's like, this is conflicting with the story I have in the future. So if we can just take out this caption um, 
and uh but yeah so so just learning that um and uh yeah i mean i basically just want to keep working with chuck till the you know till the wheels fall off uh, yes you should as you should okay man the super chats keep coming in okay so let me see chimera two dollars he says if you could get the rights to any dc character who would you pick question no question the question fix age Ooh. Oh, oh not the, the female version? Uh, what was what? Renee Montoya? No, <laughs> the, the real version. Vic yeah, yeah, I'm more about the real versions as well. What about, well, I, I mean, obviously, Chuck, you created a bunch of DC characters, but is there any, would you like Bane back or would you like to? Yeah, I'd like the remaining 94% of Bane I don't own. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I see those royalty statements and they send you like what they made and then how it breaks down to what you get. <laughs> It's like, yeah, I want 100% of that. Yeah, well, I know they, they must have had a nice check. Uh, I, I got the, the Injustice video games, and boy, they had Bane in both of those. And, I, you know, especially in Injustice 2, I thought Bane was incredible in that. And I was like, I, was like, I hope Chuck got a nice check. <laughs> I, I, love, I love the games, and I love Lego, because that money doesn't go through Warners. Once oh. it goes through Warners, you know, they go out and buy themselves a new car or something. I don't know what they do with the money, but it all doesn't get down to me and Graham. Uh, but the Lego and the video money, yeah, we get all that. So that's cool. Oh, sweet. Okay. And then, what's it, Maldecito, Maldecito 1904 uh, for $5. He says, I wanted to say thank you for everything, Chuck and Zach. Uh, keep doing what you do, and I'll keep looking forward to it, as will I. I know uh, – I know I'm I'm excited every time. It's, it's so, I was like, oh, Chuck Dixon, uh, you know, your boy Zach, which uh, I'm a, an admirer of Zach. Uh, I, I, he definitely inspired me. And uh, that's why, you know, I try to support these projects. But actually, Richard, I wanted to ask you a question about Iron Sights when, when we kind of skimmed through that before. Um, when you launched Iron Sights, and I think what originally it was maybe about 119,000, and you did another crowdfund and it raised another 10. So basically around 100 and 30 some odd thousand dollars and people were like ha ha he's failed after the other one did four hundred thousand, he failed i did not see that as a failure but you i i noticed you seem to have certain people that are working in professional comics that want you to be less successful uh they are envious of the over one million dollars you have raised <laughs> and uh because they know they're not making it there you you can look on uh, comic cron and see that their books aren't selling like that and, you know uh how do you just deal with all the haters well i was reading this uh uh mike Barron comic i don't even remember the comic but i remember the phrase and it says uh the dog barks but the caravan moves on <laughs> <laughs> yes yes it does but yeah I, I was very excited for number one the success that iron sights had and i noticed when you launched iron sights too you you barely said anything and the, the, it started exploding within i mean that had to make you feel good when iron sights 2 did so well yeah so that's just about to go to the printer um like <laughs> Literally, I'm approving the file today, and I'll probably be at the printer next week. But uh, the thing about this is, is that like this is, um, I, I was watching what was it? Something a biography about the founding fathers, and one of them said that it was going to take a thousand years to explore, you know, the continent. Obviously, it didn't. <laughs> um, but uh, we we just got to the east coast. Like we don't we don't we are, we haven't even sent scouts out. We don't know how big this new continent is. Um, uh, so I, I try to do everything a little different. I'll be really heavy on promotion for one. Another one, I'll just be kind of light because I also don't know how much people, how, uh, how much money they have per year to spend on my stuff. So I'm still trying to uh, figure it out. I actually have a meeting next week for the first time with a with a real business consultant to, you know, kind of look at the future and kind of plan things. But mm -hmm. that's going to be taken with a grain of salt too, because this is all new territory. We are in unexplored space. We're using models of things, but it's a lot of guesswork, you know? So basically that, that thing about, uh, uh, you know, um, I use the profits. I, I'm like three projects ahead um, on things. You know, uh, you and <laughs> because, you know, you got to be prepared for something. That's just an utter failure. And I mean, you look at um, one of the things I always think about is, you know, you know, the sad Ben Affleck meme. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he's just sad, and he's just kind of staring out into space. One of the things when uh, IMDb, you know, uh, the the uh, website about movies, it's like a oh, Amazon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, I would look at the career of an actor, and it's shocking. They have they will have a movie that makes eight million dollars or eight hundred million dollars, and then they will have a movie that makes two million dollars three months later. And the difference, you're like, there, you know, there's very few movie stars that you can get out there every single day. Even people called movie stars, they aren't because if it's not the right mix, nobody goes. Nobody like sometimes sub one million. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to uh, uh, get ahead of the curve in case there's one massive failure, but I'm also trying to to learn about a effectively a new continent. Mm, interesting. I'm like, man, that was a great answer. Okay. <laughs> Let me see. You get, obviously, I, I must take notes because I, I try to copy everything you do. So that is, uh, I must make, it's, uh, listen to that. So I'll have to rewind this and play it back uh, later tonight as I'm writing. Uh, Optimus Deadpool for $5. He says, I would love to see Cable, I mean, not Cable, Cobra with uh, a Stallone movie comic written by uh, Mr. Dixon and with uh, Simon Sympotier as the artist. Uh, check his Twitter for some cool. Uh, some sick cobra art, and uh, yeah, well, I always love the cobra. Yeah, uh, Sylvester Stallone's done so many cool movies. Uh, I love his stuff. So uh, yeah, I, I think uh, you know it's a shame that uh, Indiegogo does not allow any you know blades or weapons because I would love to get the license to Cobra and then sell scissors. <laughs> <laughs> So they won't let you like crowdfund a new knife or something. Something no, like, like like we we were talking. Chuck's like, hey, I got a guy who who wants to do a knife. It's like, yeah, we can't do it. Um, is surprised. anyone in the chat asking what the scissors joke is about? Yeah, I'm, I, I, yeah, but I I I saw Cobra, so I, I thought, you know what? <laughs> you know, it's one of the best scenes in cinematic history. Uh, uh, Stallone is just like super cool L.A. cop, and he comes home. And he, it's the 80s, so of course, a cop, you know, making probably about 32 grand in 1988. He can, he can see the ocean from his <laughs> bachelor pad. And he goes, he's doing all this stuff. And it, the, my favorite thing about it is he does everything cool. He doesn't set his keys down. He, like, throws them across the room, and they land right where he wants. And then he takes a piece of pizza out of the freezer. He's looking at, I think, printouts or something from, like, a fax machine. He cuts off, like, just the tip. And then he eats the cold pizza. They don't talk about it. You never see anything else. But it's one of those things. It just has to be experienced. <laughs> oh man! But yeah, I, I'm I'm curious as to what uh, you know. Uh, Cobra, the uh, the Motor City Cobra, that was supposed to be Beverly Hills Cop. That was Beverly Hills Cop. Really? And um, yeah, so the uh, Sylvester Stallone was the original Beverly Hills Cop. And he had came up with this guy, the Cobretti, the Motor City Cobra, which, as you as you guys will know, Axel Foley is still from Detroit in the Beverly Hills Cop movie. Right, right, right. Huh. As uh, as the the studio and uh, it sounded like from the interviews I've seen Sylvester do, they kind of started having different ideas of what the movie was going to be. They wanted to infuse more comedy in it, and he was like, "No, nah, it's a straight action movie." Blah blah blah. Um, you know, he he stepped back and he kept his Motor City Cobra idea and came out with uh, Cobra, and obviously some unknown guy named Eddie Murphy on his like third <laughs> movie, uh, uh, a Beverly Hills Cop, and it just bombed horribly. Even though I hear they're about to try to do Beverly Hills Cop Four. <laughs> <laughs> best, so, the best spoken line in uh, Cobra is not the you know the the slogan, but uh, when the guy threatens up to. Blow up the grocery store and still and says, Go ahead, I don't shop here. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great lie. I love it. The, the scissor thing is really, uh, it, people, Zach, you have people are like, Scissors, what's going on? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, watch Cobra and it, it makes perfect sense. I, I watched Cobra, I was probably too young to watch Cobra when I did, but uh, uh, I was spending the night over at my friend Jeff's house. And his his mom didn't really know anything about it, and she uh, she took us to to see Cobra, and then she realized eh, 
probably should have took you two more. <laughs> you know, I was like eight or nine when it came out. It was, yeah, I was really young to see it. But it great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just used to do that. Let me see. Hold on. Let me see. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so you're at $93,432 right now. The chat is always looking um, to see uh, to see how Expendables Go to Hell is doing. It is, uh, yeah, man. I, let me see. Hold on. Let me see. Cruder Quotient, he says. Imagine Cuff's double-bladed knife on a crowdfunder. Ooh. Somebody who makes knives actually wanted to... Uh, uh, do that, and I sent them to John Malin because he designed that double bladed knife. Absolutely, absolutely, the great John Malin, Malin Militia. Yeah, and uh, let me see, let me see. Uh, it's all fun and games. He says, "Can you be too young?" Yeah, I, I, I think I was uh, as a, a adult. I was like that probably warped my little mind, but I watched a lot. <laughs> Man, these uh, they've pussified so many of these movies now. You know, it's like I used to watch like Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and Stallone, and they would just blow people up. And it was just I was like, you know, like I remember watching like Commando with with Schwarzenegger, and I was like, oh, which was actually written by Jeff Loeb, if I'm not mistaken. And he wrote, I know he did Commando and Teen Wolf. Which uh, I think um, Commando is um, uh, Stephen D'Souza. <clears throat> but. Uh, was Loeb on that too? But yeah, Jeff. I know Jeff Loeb had uh, he had a writing credit on that, but he did oh, yeah, that and Teen Wolf, and you know that's uh, that was that, it. Kind of shocked me because Teen Wolf Two was awful, but yeah, I could not. Uh, let me see, uh, Daniel C. Let me check here. He says, when writing for comics, does Chuck change the way he writes to fit the artist? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I like to. Uh, I just did a story with Kelly Jones. Um, I got invited to an eight-page Catwoman story with Kelly Jones, Ooh, nice. and I said, "You know, what do you want? What do you feel like drawing?" And he says, "I want to draw docs, <laughs> and I want to draw Clayface." So I wrote a story set upon a cargo container ship with Clayface and Catwoman. And uh, so, yeah, I like to tailor. I, I, when I worked with Joe Kubert, um, <clears throat> I decided going in that I wanted to do a lot of weather because Joe was so good at it. And then the first time we talked, Joe said, well, before we start, and he tells me how much he loves drawing weather. <laughs> he mm. said, you get a lot of like storms and rain and snow into the story. I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Great idea, Joe. Well, no, I agree with what you just said because I've noticed after working with Kanan on uh, the first brand book, he likes drawing like smoke and fire and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, I definitely know I need to, some explosions here where he could do that little curling smoke. I think uh, he liked the way Todd McFarlane drew, and he was, and and he cited Ethan Van Skyver's, uh, you know, the way he does like energy and stuff. And he he said he just likes drawing like that. So I know I try to include scenes like that where I know we're going to get nice smoke and you know oh, stuff. Yeah. All around. Hell of the story. I mean, I just did a an artist, a fantastic artist, approached me recently. And he said, "Let's do something together." So I sent him this pitch for an idea. And part of it was set out west. And I was stunned when he said, I don't like drawing horses. So, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. This guy can draw anything, but he does not like drawing horses. So we had to come up with something else. I've, I've noticed hands and feet are always seems to be a problem as well. Yeah, yeah. But I was just, I mean, this guy's amazing. And I just, I realized I've never seen a guy draw an animal. You know, so what are you going to do? Let me see. Uh, Cruder Quotient asks, is there a potential for more Expendables books or is it a one on, a one and done? Now, if this is successful, and obviously it is successful, uh, we're going to be doing more. <laughs> we pretty much have carte blanche from Sly to continue. Oh, I like that. Let me see. And that's another thing that's so amazing about this is it's not only, you know, I get to work on a dream franchise, but there's like... Like like he told you with the signatures, there's no hoops. There's no administration. You get an idea, you put it up, go. And and we've been good. We give. We've been given kind of you know an you know open road. Like we don't have to go double check everything. Uh, the lore is pretty easy to understand. You know, there's three movies, and uh, one miniseries before. So you know, there's not like you know uh, very complicated things we have to send to for them to you know where where do you get the the crystals for luke skywalker's thing oh yeah. this, looks like this, this we, we don't have to worry about that 
And so we're just moving forward, making just amazing uh, action stories. All right. And uh, it seems my commando, uh, Jeff Loeb, they sparked a little uh, controversy there. But I have, uh, it is up, uh, up uh, at least uh, perhaps uh, Wikipedia is incorrect, but he was credited as, and it's on IMDb too, he is credited as, he, he may not have came, he may have been just brought in to polish the script, but he is listed as one of the, uh, one of the writers on, you know. My, my, my guess would be was he was the first writer and they brought in the Sousa. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, all yeah. of the, uh, you know, cringeworthy lines in that movie. That goes to <laughs> the with Sousa. Yeah, it was like, but you know, yeah, he's got a, he's got at least a, a IMDb credit on it. So yeah, I, good for yeah. But but yeah, but Teen Wolf. Uh, see, I, I wouldn't take credit for Teen Wolf two, although I think he had something to do with that one as well. But yeah, Teen Wolf one, love that movie. It was uh, it was it was great. Let me see. Well, I wouldn't take credit for the third season of Lost either, but he worked on Ooh, that. Yeah, oh, they lost their way on that. Uh, yeah, yeah, they got lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely got lost. I was like, the polar bear? What happened? I was like, okay, so let me see. Dr. Meatball has a question for Zach. He says, uh, what, can you give an update on Ghost Gun? No. Um, Ghost Gun is this idea I came up with, and I was really excited. When, when I just started the channel, I was kind of, you know, dumb. So I would just say, like, I would come up with an idea and, and tell the whole thing in a video. <laughs> and Ghost Gun people just made fun of me for it. Um, <laughs> it does seem to have some uh, people bring it up every couple of months. The one that is actually really uh, popular that P I, I mentioned it once three years ago, and people bring it up constantly to this day, <laughs> is uh, is an idea that uh, me and Chuck tried to crack and we couldn't do it. It's this story called 499. It's kind of like a 80s story in an alternate timeline. It's like Footloose uh, meets uh, Red Dawn, uh, but we haven't oh, been able to. As a kid, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we haven't been able to crack it. Mm, interesting. You, I, I am always uh, as I as I told you when I interviewed you last year, Richard. I am always curious how your mind works because uh, I don't know you. You seem to be able to multitask quite well. I can do like two things at once, and that's about it. And you've got like five or six things you're you're playing you're playing chess everybody else is playing checkers so I don't know <laughs> well the, one of the one of the things is that um like uh um, one of the things that confuses me about the comic book industry especially now is people are not excited and you can feel that they're not excited and I, I was talking about this I feel like over here in crowdfunding that we have the monopoly on excitement. It's the only thing people are talking about, whether they love us or hate us. It's the only thing being uh, discussed with passion in the comic book industry right now. So I wake up, I work from home. I'm on it. I'm, I'm up till three, four in the morning. And then I wake up at eight and I start all over again. I work seven days a week. Uh, although I will say it took me a little while to get all my all my ducks in a row, uh, some real boring, basic paperwork management and file management took me a while. And I, I paid the price on that a couple of times. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's just all day, every day, you know, just driving right to the hoop. Okay. Well, let me ask you both this question. Cause this was something that, that happened on uh, the day you launched, which I thought was kind of ironic. Uh, Richard Pace, obviously, uh, he had a few comments about, uh, uh, obviously, Sylvester Stallone agreeing to allow you guys to do this project, you know, uh, Chuck working with you, all this. And then sometime around on that same day, he had made a comment about not thinking that trans athletes should be allowed to compete against women. And then a pack of dogs <laughs> ran on him and he spent the next several hours apologizing for having to dare say that, oh, well, I, you know, I was wrong, guys. I'm sorry I said that, that trans athletes shouldn't compete against natural born women. And they have a disadvantage. They have an advantage. And all this good. so I, I kind of thought that was a little strange, but I, I'm, I'm assuming you're, I know you've gotten off to twatter there, Zach, but I know that you have people that constantly hit you with this stuff. So I did it, did it amuse you or did you just go, Oh my God. Um, it actually, it actually, I mean, I, I tried to stay out of that for the last a year or so when you're just describe when you're describing the situation right now it just it just made me think about those signs you see at some beaches 
that say warning strong undertow <laughs> um, yeah you don't want to go to beaches like that and that's what i would say for things like that but you know one of the things is there's i mean that's a whole that's a whole video just to talk about all the craziness like but like i said i just try to concentrate i put my blinders on just like a horse you know i, I gotta focus on stuff and um i was talking about this you know I, you know, I, you know i've been driving and we, we've had a lot of fun and i always had this like goal it's like man when i I, I had a bit I was going to do when I hit $1 million in sales for the company, um, which happened like a week or so ago, I was going to go to, to uh, Walmart and uh, grab the, uh, the shoes in a box instead of off the peg, like the ones. Wear. <laughs> but instead what I did is I, I, you know, I was keeping track, you know, yeah, I was in refresh all day long, but I actually just kind of like pulled over and I just kind of like thought, and it was actually a very serious moment. It's like, this is no joke. You got people counting on you. Um, and you really got to, you got to step it up, you know, in terms of delivery, in terms of leadership, because I've been a leader in the, uh, you know, the military, but you can just yell at people, you know, it's pretty simple, you know, uh, organization, you can't really do that um, in the in uh, the comic book industry, because people, because they're artists, you know, so you got to find ways to motivate them, although there are some artists who, who will like that, but I would say that was a small percentage. So, you know, I'm just trying to uh, uh, improve. And the idea is like this situation, like what we're what we're creating right here, the incredible excitement from people. That's what comics is supposed to do. You're, it's supposed to be a diversion from your life. It's supposed to be incredibly fun and exciting. And that's what we're trying to bring back. Yeah, comics are an immediate experience for the reader and for the creators. I mean, it's the most raw medium you can get in entertainment. It's, it's a guy writing and a guy drawing. I mean, how much more simple can you get? And you just go nuts and you run on enthusiasm. I've been doing this 30 years plus. I still run on enthusiasm. I still love what I do. But, you know, more and more as I worked for the big publishers, I saw this, you know, jaded, too cool for school attitude that I just didn't relate to. You know, I'm, I'm still a 12-year-old kid all worked up over Hulk and the thing fighting each other. I mean, I just nice. want to do this stuff. You know, and um, I don't get it, you know, when you get these sort of postmodern creators. Reading the script, because Chuck was turning them in, I, and I, I believe chunks of like five pages at a time. And so it was almost like serialized, you know, entertainment, you know, uh, like back in the day. Um, and it was insane. He would do these jokes. I would laugh out loud. And, you know, I just kind of, we kind of knew where it was end, but it's like, Oh, we got Valkyries on winged horses. Cool. <laughs> like, yeah, I saw that it. and I was like, that's definitely going to be interesting. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I mean, because I, I actually don't have a very good visual imagination when I read a script. Like, I imagine everything like I'm like at the grocery store. Everything's like a flat angle and it, it's happening 10 feet in front of me. Um, <laughs> but like when this happened, I mean... <sighs> You, you got to see it to believe it once you when you're like okay so this is pretty crazy pff, it just started and that, that's how it is like i said when i get you know the pages drawn i got the page from graham and i literally said out loud i forgot there were war elephants in this story the story <laughs> is so big and crazy and fun there are giant uh, i think i said genghis khan but it would have been like hannibal barca war elephants with giant saddles on them whatever you call that Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. Go. I just indulged all my toy soldier fantasies on this one. I just yeah, you had Audie Murphy in there. I saw it. I oh, was yeah, like, yeah. God, I have Audie Murphy in there. Yeah, and I've and I knew because I've heard people like, how did Audie Murphy get it? And I was like, hey, you know, we're friends on Facebook, and I noticed you've posted about Audie a few times, and so I was like, that's definitely Chuck. I know that's Chuck. <laughs> Audie Murphy was such a hero to me when I was a kid. You know, both for being a cowboy star and a war hero. Mm. No. Had to get him in here. Yeah, well, well you did. I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm definitely looking forward. I'm, I'm excited just talking to you guys. It's even. I was like, where's the book at? Come on, bring it on. But uh, <laughs> let me see. Uh, Ray Morales is asking, he says, so this book is going to be published by Dynamite uh, since the OG uh, Expendables prequel comics. Or, but I don't think that's the case. Obviously, uh, Richard, you can explain. No. Yeah, so they had, I, I have no idea when, but um, their, their rights to it lapsed sometime in the past. And uh, Stallone has the publishing rights. So this is real simple. It's Stallone has the publishing rights. We got an agreement and we're putting it out. 
So it's Splato. Splato, your your company. No, it's going to be. It's oh. a new imprint that we're we're doing called. It's called Decision. Or sorry, that's a great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I just tripped. I put my cleats on and just tripped right into the field. It's called Destination <laughs> Comics. Destination. And, okay. Yeah, Destination colon Comics. Um, I, because I've been I've been using this catchphrase. It's like all these SJWs. They're they're just using comics as a bus stop to get to Hollywood. I was like, comics is the destination. Yeah. You talk. You read these interviews with all these actors, directors, rock stars. They all say comics was my dream as a kid. Joe Rogan says the same thing. I can't understand, and it, you know, for some people it's very easy. For some people it's way too easy to get into comics. But for me, it was difficult. For most people, it's incredibly difficult. I cannot imagine fighting to get somewhere and then immediately wanting to leave. So that's why I was like, this is the dream. This is the destination. We're here. Yeah, I call them tourists. You know, uh, they're, they're traveling through on their way to writing the great American novel. I, all I ever wanted to write was comics. It's all I cared about. It's all I ever wanted to do. I, you know, I had no other aspirations. I think that's the secret of me getting along with Sly so well. I'm not shoving a screenplay in his face every five minutes. He knows <laughs> I have no interest in writing for the movies. I really don't want to do it. I, you, the, th the thing is, you know, I, uh, I'm sure Chuck has lots of friends in Hollywood. I've got friends there too. Even the successful ones, they're not happy. <laughs> like, no. They're yeah. not happy. Like, I, like I said, it goes from Sly gives a thumbs up. Me and Chuck discuss it. He writes it. Graham draws it, and he sends it to me. And it's like freaking amazing. We got I, I don't know this World War II plane flying over a, a, a river of lava. I just got the page today. I was like, uh, can we add a little bit to the lava? Like, it's insane that this even exists. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. I mean, can we add a little bit more to the law? Like, yeah. Matter of fact, I, man, I'm like, where my copy at, man? You need to be shipping that. To, I know it's not done yet, but damn, ship it to me already. We're uh, almost go ahead, Chuck. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, let me let me see. Sweetcast is asking. He says, "I want to see Zach's cover and also Billy Tucci's." Which, uh, yeah, I, that's the one I bought. I bought Billy. I love Billy, so I, I had to buy his. Uh, and you know, supported she when he relaunched it. Uh, like I said, he he allowed me and Kanan to use uh, she on uh, brand way of the gun. So I was very, I was like, oh, I saw Billy had a cup. It was it was between that one and Kelsey Sue. So I love Kelsey, so I was like, uh, and so I flipped a coin and it was Billy. So I bought Billy's cover. On well, one. the funny thing is that, um, so so there's a couple weird things with the cover. Usually people have the cover done beforehand. But since this was a secret project, you know, less people know the better. So a couple of people, I told them like two weeks before it starts, they're like, hey, I'm excited, but, you know, it's going to take me a while. And then we get this amazing artist. I don't want to say his name yet. Absolutely amazing. He hits uh -huh. us up like, uh, I don't know, a couple of days ago last week. He's like, I want to be in on this. I go, you're you're amazing, but like we got five covers, like we're 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 fully stocked. And he goes, all right, cool, I understand. I'll like, uh, work on some of the future. I go, definitely, definitely. So then yesterday, he just sends it to Chuck, and I was like, this guy's bold. He he did the cover, like with no contract, with no pay. He just did it, and he's like, this is a total money move. He's like, check it out. So I was like. Okay, we need to talk. So now, <laughs> so now he's like in the complete catbird seat because I want that thing too bad. I shouldn't even be saying how bad I want this thing. Mm. Uh, so now uh, we're we're trying to figure out how to use this sixth cover. But as for the cover, you know, reveals, um, uh, we were going to have Kelsey's done when we launched, but Kelsey has Kelsey has the hardest job because he has the main cover. So it's, it's, he's got like, oh my gosh, he's got to negotiate, you know, obviously Stallone's going to be huge on the cover and then the title is huge and long. So he's got to work with this like very particular composition. Um, so that'll probably be next week. Uh, I believe uh, Billy's going to show his this weekend. Yeah, I saw him say he was sketching it. Yeah. And, 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 oh, uh, cool. Yeah. And I, and and I heard then, from Kelsey um, earlier and he was, I had, uh, I was trying to surprise everyone and I, I, I invited him a few days ago to hop on this stream. And he was like, he's like, I'm trying to finish the, the Expendables cover. And he's like, I don't want to go to Chuck and Zach empty handed. 
And I was like, okay. I was like, well, I'll send you the link anyway. If you if you can hop on, you can. If you can't, I understand. But yeah, it's a it, you know, Kelsey's a sweetheart. I love him, and you know, he's always uh, been super kind to me. So uh, uh, let me. Oh, sweet cast. Uh, who? Yeah, the sweet cast is super chat two dollars, and he says, how much does Zach predict the book will make? I I don't know. I mean, I got a goal. Um, but you know, these things are, they're really hard. Again, I'm talking, you know, going back to the, the new continent thing, when it was me and a handful of other people in summer of 2018, there was, there was more Buffalo than you could ever hunt. You know what I mean? In your entire <laughs> life. Um, at some point we have to kind of manage these, you know, these herds. That's a oh, what a horrible analogy. <laughs> uh, customers as Buffalo. Uh, deer let's say a, a more aesthetically pleasing there was more deer than you could ever need in your, in your entire you know 100 lifetimes but now there's a lot more people on these shores so we gotta we have to manage it you know at, at some point um uh, at some point you know a lot of us are friends but at some point you know the purchase for mine means another guy doesn't get a sale because the customers have so much per month or, or per year. That being said, this is an unprecedented um, uh, project. Um, and we're not locked into all of our sales in one month or two months. Um, it'll basically just be, you know, uh, you know, we got the, you know, the permission, the thumbs up. So we all have a deal and it, it's uh, it'll continue from there. Um, I think it's going to be quite good. I think we're in the top 18 uh, of Indiegogo's since 2018, which which is basically when Indiegogo became a thing uh, for comics. So we're, we're, I mean, we're we're trying for the number one spot, absolutely. Let me see. Okay, well, we have a question for Mr. Dixon from Ryan Hawk, and uh, he uh, I've had him on. He's a creator. And let me see. He says, Chuck, other than Graham, who draws your favorite Bane? I, I honestly can't think of anybody other than Graham. Um, um, Butch, Butch Geist did him in an uh, issue of Birds of Prey, and mm -hmm. I, I hope did an awesome job. You know, uh, but, but, you know, I love Butch. And I love his work, but Graham's always number one for Bane. Interesting, interesting. See, it's all fun and games. Since having the covers drop during the campaign does give you the potential for some reveals that'll give it a boost through the middle. And uh, well, like I said, I, I like the way you uh, you you keep uh, your campaigns rather simple. And I know what I'm getting. It doesn't say a bag full of dicks, and then you have to click on this and figure out what it is. And I I, I like that. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where that came from, but I just like it. I know what I'm buying. <laughs> so there was this trend for like the first couple of years where people would give like cutesy pie names. And I came in, I just put a hard stop to that. And I am very direct with people. I was like, no. W what should I call my book pinup and t-shirt perk level? You call that thing book plus pinish. <laughs> you could also call it book and pinup and t-shirt. Like, make it clear. I go to these these campaigns. I don't know what the hell I'm I'm buying. And they got pictures. They got lists. Words. We, we as humans, we settled on words as communication a long time ago. Long time ago. Uh, let's just stick with words. Words is working for all of us. Well, let let me ask you. This is something I have often wondered about you, Zach. Uh, are you a Ferengi? Uh, have you read the rules of acquisition? Uh, I haven't read them. I'm sure there's a, a couple websites that print them all out. <laughs> yes, you know, there there's always the thing I'm working on, and then there's the thing I'm watching, and and those things strongly influence. So I, I remember, I, like, what two years ago, I was watching a lot of Deep Space Nine. So I used to talk about the Ferengi, but uh, realistically, I, I'm not. I I do things that are for pure love of comics. Um, you know, behind the hood, of you know, uh, you know, knowing who's got the contracts and who's got this and that is uh i always have this friend who it drives him insane anytime you talk about net worth he goes nobody knows anyone else's net worth not even the irs nobody um so you know uh, things behind the hood are more profitable and it's sometimes surprising which ones are the truly profitable ones but i do things for uh, all the stuff i do is for love and things make different levels of profit for me um, it, that actually doesn't affect how I do it. If I was a Ferengi, I would just purely do things on profit. That being said, 
I haven't lost money yet, and I have no intention to lose money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. We, when I was in the Marines, we had this uh, battalion recon guy who was giving us some survival training, and he said this thing that at first I laughed, and now I think it's like the truest thing ever. He's a, he's like uh, this, the way to stay warm is to not get cold. <laughs> That's, that's interesting. Uh, it, it's it's true though. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and and the way to 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 make money is to not lose it. Well, yeah. There there you are. And uh, let's see. Corey Landis says Zach is a Ferengi American. And Daniel Parker actually put one of the rules of acquisition in the in the chat: never place friendship above profit. And that is a that is a very smart uh, rule of acquisition. So. Here, Arthur Brown, the uncanny Kodiak for five dollars. He says, "Was there any expendable character you couldn't use?" I really enjoyed the tattooist and even Church. Uh, what hoops came about from using other characters? So, um, and uh, I spoke over. Probably Chuck is best to answer this one. But the way it was communicated to me is that we had the likeness rights for the people from the first movie. Ah, um, okay. So that's why you'll see likenesses for those characters. And other characters from later movies, it'll be like their race and age and hairstyle. <laughs> um, and that can definitely change in the future. Uh, but that would be something we'd have to, you know, um, figure yeah. out. Yeah, my, my guideline was um, Sly got me uh, the job of writing dialogue for an Expendables video game that, that never came out. And, um, the, the, and the guideline there was it was the core Expendables from the first film uh, that they're, they had signed over their likenesses. So I thought, well, well, okay, well, then those are the characters we can use in the comic without question. We can't have Arnold. We can't have Bruce. You know, uh, oh, that'll have to be negotiated down the line. But uh, we, we're safe with the guys we have. You know, that's actually kind of interesting because they put uh, they put Arnold Schwarzenegger's likeness in Mortal Kombat 11, but the voiceover actor was not... Arnold, I was like, if you paid to use his likeness, why wouldn't you just pay him an extra few dollars to actually voice the character? Because I was, it was kind of disappointing this guy doing this bad Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. And really? Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. I mean, yeah, it's a horrible. His 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 Arnold is uh, sure. Let's get into chopper. You know, it was like it was weird. It was I, I don't know. I, I really wish if, but I, I guess those are two separate rights or whatever. But. They actually used it. Looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was like, wow. <laughs> and I was like, you know, when I saw Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to be in Mortal Kombat, you know, I was like, interesting. And he was tweeting it out and all this. And, and I was like, so they paid you. Why didn't they just have you come in and do a voiceover? Come on, man. I was disappointed when that guy opened his mouth, and I was like, that's not Arnold Schwarzenegger. The the the, the coolest thing about doing the video game was is that you know the original cast did the voices. And, mm. uh, and uh, I never heard them. I mean, I'd love to get a copy of that. But but Sly told me that they kept cracking up during the recording session at, at some of the stuff I wrote. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so Redline Fiction for two pounds. Uh, I th we covered this earlier, but I, you guys can hit it back. He said, do you intend to do more Expendables books? And I know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll yeah. keep going. Well, after hearing that, I want to crowdfund that Expendables video game. Ooh. <laughs> I'll tell you, dialogue in video games, I mean, you, you come up with every permutation of let's get out of here you can think of. <laughs> well, they had this, uh, I just started rewatching Saturday Night Live for the first time in like 20 years. And they had this, I don't know anything about football. They had a football player. He was doing the, uh, like the Madden, you know, 2021. Uh -huh. And it was a hilarious sketch because they had him do one thing that was like, I did it. And then everything else was about him failing. And getting worse and worse and worse. <laughs> and he's like, there's only going to be one victory? They're like, no, no, it's cool. Go on, go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you mentioned Madden, you know, earlier you was like, if we didn't have the rights to actually use that person's likeness, it was like the approximate race and size or whatever, kind of uh, pastiche or, or whatever of uh, – of the character, but that's kind of, you made me think about Madden and NCAA college football and a lot of those games where they ended up getting sued because they were using people's names. And then they started doing the thing where it's, it has that guys, you know, it'll be like T Tebow 
And then it'll just have it'll just be this like white guy with his number, but it won't actually have his face in it or whatever, you know. That kind really, of thing. I'm not a sports guy. I just always assume they got. Well, yeah, I guess it would be ridiculous to get likeness rights for everyone. Well, and, you know, when, when you're and, when you're an amateur athlete, that's one of the things with the NCAA, which I, I disagree with because they're making billions of dollars off of these guys, and then then they're like, hey, we just own your rights uh, in perpetuity and we can keep, you know, and then a couple of, I know one of the guys was going to UCLA. He was a basketball player and he, uh, you know, he they had won the NCAA championship at a UCLA and he went to the pros and kind of bombed out, blew his knee and everything got injured. And he just, he kept noticing the games were making all this money and he would be, he'd be somewhere and someone would bring up a, you know, the, the video game and want him to sign the, the sleeve or whatever. He's like, I'm in this game. <laughs> and he realized that they looked, they used his, uh, they use his number and they just kind of made it look like him, but they, you know, they just kind of, that kind of deal. But he was like, you guys are making all this money and you're using my name and my number and all this kind of stuff. And I'm not getting a dime for this. And you so know what? I'm not a sports guy, but a video game I would play is if they got the, the East West bowl from Key and Peel, <laughs> they put all those football players in there. <laughs> oh god every now and again i'll go back to youtube and i'll google that because it, it's this thing is hilarious it's like well the uh, funny th- I, they, I guess they made three i just found like a third one they did and by the end like it's completely insane i was like i want a video game with all of these players in there quantron san <laughs> exactly uh, colorado state <laughs> i was just like what are y'all doing i was like i don't know how they come up but obviously jordan peele you know is uh you know, it was funny. Uh, some late last year, Kanan drew. Uh, he drew just. He was goofing around and drew uh, a piece for us, and they tagged Jordan Peele in it. And he started retweeting it. It was crazy. I was like, "Oh man, Kanan just got geeked out because he's just like, oh, Jordan." Peele. That's cool. If we need to do comics and we'd be unfettered, uh, we could do whatever cast members we wanted to. You know, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, you gotta get the likeness rights because I know. You know, Sly had like his dream cast and, and people he wanted to be in these movies that they couldn't get for whatever reason. So we yeah. do have uh, one person in there that is. <laughs> guess who they are. Oh, okay. It'll be a fun little, it'll be a fun little <laughs> bit. You're like, this looks familiar. This silhouette looks familiar. Yeah, that was um, Richard's suggestion. Mm. <laughs> Oh man, come on! You gotta give me, you gotta give me uh, some exclusive here. Yeah, I mean, can't, can't, can't do oh, it. Oh man, come on! I was like, oh. but, but I, but I remember the the one production meeting I was in with Sly. You know, we're in a room and and all around the walls are movie posters from that studio, and uh, he's pointing at the posters, going, "I want that person, I want that person," <laughs> and he pointed to a poster for uh, Righteous Kill, and he goes, "Yeah, I want him." And the producers go, yeah, well, you, well, you can get De Niro. All you, all you need is a check. He'll, he'll make anything. And he goes, no, no, I, I want Pacino. <laughs> and they're like, you're never going to get him for one of these movies. <laughs> so Either of you watch The Irishman? Our face type character into one of these uh, comics we do. Did, did either of you watch The Irishman? I'm, I'm curious to get your yeah, thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you enjoy it? Yeah, I, I liked it. I liked it. It's not Scorsese's best, but I enjoyed it. What was weird about it was... Um, you know, there were so many characters in there that uh, people that I know actually met in real life. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I used to know a guy who was uh, Jimmy Hoppe's cellmate. And um, and then my, my, my sister associated with a lot of mobsters. So she knew all the Philly guys that were in the movie, Phil Testa and guys like that. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. What about you, Zach? Did you did you like it? Uh, I was curious to get your thoughts on it, or did you? See no, it? I didn't. I didn't see it. It looked. A, it's too long, and it's. It takes me in a, three days to watch. You know, a yeah. ninety minute movie that would have taken me two weeks. I enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed it. Um, special effects. Here's the problem. I thought special effects because they spent one hundred and sixty million dollars on this movie, which is unheard of on a Netflix movie. So okay, one hundred sixty million on a Netflix movie. And they use this groundbreaking because they had to do all this stuff to de-age everybody, right? Here's the thing, though. Uh, Robert De Niro's like, what, 82, 83 or something? He's, he's already, you know, and and so even though he looks younger, he's re- he's moving kind of stiff. Exactly. I, uh, I just watched Tron Legacy. and it, Oh, crazy. yeah. <laughs> and they got Jeff Bridges and they do the young one. Now, yeah, the, yeah. the de-aging is bad, but it's also, it's like, 
it's he, he can tell he's 58 like he moves like he's 58 he talks like you really at some point just need to to get a younger person in there and, and just uh do that um or just you know cast them uh, older but yeah they, they talk slower the energy level is lower so they don't they don't feel like the characters who are probably what 45 to 55 mainly yeah it was, it was kind of weird because like de niro's walking with this kind of like hunch on his back but he's got this young looking face and i was like oh. well the other thing the thing about scorsese is uh uh the wolf of wall street i mean he was probably pushing 70 when he directed that mm. that feels like a young man's movie it has the energy you know i love wolf uh, of wall street. that's one of the things that impresses me the most out of that movie is the energy level of it yeah, whereas the irishman i saw the previews it looked like a a, 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 a an older tired man well, <laughs> it's funny you said that because I like that even when it is young De Niro, I was like, somebody get this guy a, a glass of warm milk and a blanket. Uh, it just, it was, <laughs> I was like, yeah, he's, he's like, you know, um, and then I saw people, some some like ex-mob guys were all arguing. It's like, well, the, the, the character De Niro played actually didn't, he's like, I know who murdered Jimmy Hoffa. They're all telling, <laughs> so I'm like. <laughs> everybody's everybody knows that somebody else murdered Jimmy Hoffa. So I'm like, oh God, yeah, I, I knew some of those guys. It, it wasn't him. So uh, <laughs> I was like, murder is still like you could it hasn't, you know, it doesn't, it, it's unlimited. It doesn't, I was like, so if you know who kills him, well, I mean, I'm sure that guy's long shuffled off the moral coil by now, but I I just uh <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny. Oh yeah. Let's see, let me see what the let me see corridor let me see Douglas Shaw says corridor crew did a video on the technology in the Irishman they cover CGI in movies and how it was yeah I've seen there's a couple people on Twitter that that uh took those where they would they would show what Robert De Niro and Al Pacino looked like you know obviously without and Joe Pesci and then they would you know it, the screen would wipe and all of a sudden you'd see all those wrinkles and everything fade away I mean yeah 160 million dollars I definitely thought they um what I've argued with a bunch of people is that if you come into the movie cold and you don't know anything about De Niro or everything, you probably won't focus on it as much. People that have been watching, you know, Pacino and Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, they've been watching them for like 35, 40 years. They're like, oh, yeah, dude, he's moving like he's 70. What are you doing? You know, but somebody else might just say maybe he had a bad back day here or something. <laughs> I don't know. You know it's yeah, just, I thought it was generally convincing uh, there was only one scene that bothered me where it just looked a little fake but you know it didn't look as integrated as it should have been for, for the most part it's pretty impressive i agree you know these guys are going to move like their age yeah so, well you know, i thought it was yeah I thought it was, you know, how athletic were these guys to begin with i mean i don't think jimmy hoffa was out on the parallel bars <laughs> Oh, uh, well, I can do a Super Bowl commercial and make that happen. Yeah, that <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, uh, Daniel C says, "Is it possible to get a two-pack tier uh, with different cover art?" Uh, I guess that's for Zach. So, um, uh, it isn't on this one, and that's just for boring logistical reasons that it wasn't set up like that. Uh, but uh, every campaign, I'm learning about the platform and things that work and don't work, like. The add-on features, I don't think that works very well mm -hmm. um, uh, because they don't show it to you until the end. Like you got to order the whole thing and like start buying it, and then it'll show you extra things. Um, but for example, um, uh, I just realized that you can actually do covers as an option, just like you can do sizes of T-shirts. So yeah. I'll remember that on on future. You can make any kind of options you want. Um, I, I didn't even think about that to try that. Uh, but we're also going to be doing um, a. Uh, it'll come out in a couple weeks for people who have backed. When you back it, you're going to get a uh, email from Crowdox, and they do. They're kind of. They're like backer kit, um, and it'll give you a chance to um, opt in for extra things. So there'll be you know T-shirts and posters, and then there'll also be some like uh, back catalog stuff from us on there. You know, while you're here, would you like to add on this? And then uh, it'll all be spit out like um, you know in one spreadsheet for the fulfillment service. All right, and we have another question for you, Zach. He says, uh, I can't even, what, Palary Derma? What? Oh Lord, I can't read that. Others say, how, how many times have you watched The Predator? So. Yeah. Predator, I've probably seen 20 times. Oh, wow. Probably yeah, you would, 
We're talking about the first ones, right? The oh, the, the, the latest one. Oh boy. The latest one? Yeah. Oh. You watch the latest one 20 times? Absolutely. Like like I said, it the, the, there's there's certain movies that, you know, obviously, you know, I was in the Marines, I was in the army, I was in Iraq, I was in Afghanistan. So I'm really attracted to franchises that cover like, the, you know, the feeling of being in a squad. And oh. the Predator has so many problems with it, but <laughs> you get this yeah. little squad and they talk like my squad did it they they it, it feels very very realistic in that wow. regard everything else is out the window crazy or it makes no sense but i really like that uh that squad uh um aspect of it yeah, i can see that as the only reason anybody would watch that movie again <laughs> Because uh, I'm trying to, it was that's not the one. That's not the one that uh, Robert Rodriguez directed, right? That's the other. Yeah, that was the Shane Black one. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, cool, cool. From like okay. two years back. Yeah, because I, I like uh, I like the original Predator, and I thought Predator Two was cool, but I, uh, original Predator, I ain't got time to bleed, you know. And all that, you know, Jesse Ventura, I, I thought that was great, and I did. I, I'd love to talk to him because you know he was also in the Running Man with Schwarzenegger. Like Schwarzenegger will reuse you if you're cool with him. So, you know, like, uh, yeah, if, if if he likes you, then you will be able to make at least a cameo in another movie. Sometimes so I thought that. Was Speaking cool. of uh, reuse, you know, one of the things uh, that I really like about Stallone is he has this, you know, just like with Expendables, Go to Hell. If you're a fan of his and you're reading all the the news about in development, and he's pitching this is he blue skies everything for like five years he was like a, a rambo might fight you know genetically enhanced werewolves it was something <laughs> like that like he will just throw everything out there Written by then if it doesn't work he'll roll it into something else like then i just found out they're like oh he just got green lit for this thing where he's not rambo but he's this other guy hunting genetically engineered werewolves or something like that. Like he, if he has an idea, he can't put it in something. He'll put it in something else. He'll just keep trying. He'll put it on the back burner, bring it back out in uh, 10 years. Yeah. The guy's a workaholic. I mean, everybody I know surrounding him says the same thing. I mean, he's just never, he's constantly moving, constantly thinking, constantly pitching ideas. And he's that way on set too. He's constantly, he, he knows everybody's job. And uh, he, he's right there to solve any problems immediately on the set because time is money. Chuck did a uh, video. I think he launched it yesterday. And I'm going to share it, you know, um, and uh, I mean, even might even switch it out as the promotional video for the Indiegogo campaign. But, uh, you know, he was talking about this part. That part, like, really got to me. Like, I've just been, like, sitting, thinking about it. Like, uh, because I've seen the making of. And you would think the making of of Expendables would be him like lifting weights or doing fight training. When you watch the making of Expendables, it's him in one of those little high chairs they have for movie sets. And he's got his kind of gnarled fingers. I think it's some of his fingers are broken or something like that. And yeah, he's, he's really writing on a steno pad and he's rewriting the dialogue. Yeah. Right there on set in uniform. And, and he was like, director every well, single right? scene is him on a steno pad. And he's like, you know, I'm trying trying to mix this up. But what Chuck said is is what he just said now. He goes, he just solves problems all day long. You know, he's been in so many movies and he's creative. That's the main thing I uh, I always think. Like he's a writer. Like that's what I think of him as a writer. Um, and so it's like I got to start doing that more. It's like my job is just to solve problems. You know, th this page we got to do this. We got to switch this person out. This person just had a family emergency. They got to drop out. We got to have the other person in. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to be like Chuck and Sly, basically. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, getting to know him and working with him and talking story with him, it made me go back and look at his movies to see the touches, these sly touches that are there. You know, I did some research and found out, yeah, this was his idea. You know, the ending of this movie was his idea. This scene was his idea. There's a scene in daylight. that's absolutely brilliant. And mm. he had lived the whole thing where basically he just – I'm not going to give up. And this is the reason this is who I am and why I can't give up right now. And it's the heart of the film. It really makes it, you know, beyond a stupid disaster movie into something <laughs> special about a character. And that's the kind of stuff he does. And, you know, he told me he had to rewrite all, most of the dialogue for Expendables on the fly on set because he didn't get the cast that he wanted. He didn't get the cast that he wrote the movie for. So he had to adjust the dialogue for each character as they went along. Oh, nice. 
Well, it's good that he's able to do that. And let's see, uh, I see Cecil in the chat. And he says Chuck is about to be sickened by Zach's taste <laughs> in films. And uh, yeah, 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 but his explanation, I, I I buy that. I can see that. No, I I would say that Zach should never stop being Zach, and that 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 is uh, I, I think that's part of his charm. I, you know, it's <laughs> like he he's like, uh, I think uh, you know, Rise of Skywalker is a great movie. Everyone's <laughs> <laughs> like, oh well, no. Well, let me put it this way. He earned his opinion on on the predator. Yeah, See? absolutely. I, I definitely uh whoo man. Yes, I, guys, I could talk to you all day, but I know you you have to get out of here. I know, matter of fact, I know you guys are with Graham Nolan. You're streaming on Billy Tucci's channel on crowdfunding yeah. comics tonight. Is that not correct? Wow, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think like in an hour and a half or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah man. But oh God. Um well, so let's wrap this one up, guys. Is there anything that either of you would like to say about, uh, you know, Expendables Go to Hell that uh, might convince someone that is teetering on backer backing, uh, you know, maybe something you could say that might convince them to go ahead and uh, do that? So, so yeah, I mean, I'll just jump in because uh, the, the main thing that popped into my head when you said that is I, I saw a woman, she says, you know, my dad's a huge fan, fan of the franchise she loves stallone uh i'm gonna buy this for him and i was like why don't you read it first <laughs> like i think you're gonna <laughs> like this i literally cannot imagine a person not liking this you would have to try to not like this i mean it's 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 just the charm and the fun of it like you might be like i don't like action movies all right do you like dragons you know, like this is everything in the kitchen sink. Like it, you just go on, you just can't freaking believe it. Um, so that's how I would, that's what I would say if you're on the, uh, the edge. Yeah. Yeah. We are desperate to entertain you. We are as desperate as the people who make Bollywood movies to make sure that everybody has a good time with this one. Well, actually I, before, before we close this out, I do have one question. Uh, are, uh, is, uh, Sylvester Stallone's character uh, going to come out as trans in Expendables Go to Hell. Is this going to happen? No. <laughs> not, not if we want to live. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like there, there needs to be a trans hashtag trans expendable. All right. <laughs> well, well, you know, it's funny. The, uh, the original script had a, a gay member of the team. Okay. The original, like, like uh, uh, when they when they got it approved, um, like I said, I'm a super fan. I tracked that thing down. Um, and the original script was really funny because uh, they have this huge part of the original script where they go to get guns. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things. They're mercenaries. You know, who put who put the air in, in the Batmobile's tires? No, nobody. It's not real. Um, but like they go down to Mexico to get some guns and it's like a 20 minute segment. So they had a they had a character that was uh, gay and, and there was lots of banter with him and the other characters. So as far as I'm concerned, that's in that universe uh, somewhere. Uh, but uh, we, uh, there's uh, I mean. I love this franchise. I was literally watching the movies and like stopping, pausing, re-listening to the same line. It's like, did he say that there were once 21 members of the team or once 22? Um, <laughs> like we're getting into exact stuff. So there's all these little bits of lore out there. Like that, th there was that character from the first uh, script. I'd like to do stuff with him. There's a character from the third movie called Galgo, which I feel like is probably one of the best characters in the whole franchise. Assuming Ronda Rousey's character is definitely not in in this one. Ronda Rousey, I have thoughts about Expendables three, but I will say I think she works quite well in the movie. She is not an actress. It's real obvious she's not an actress, but her character works just fine. There you go. All right. There is there is. I will say there's another character in Expendables three, where at one point he falls down this like elevator shaft, and they just leave him in there for like ten minutes. <laughs> like they obviously did not know what to do with them, and like every three minutes they'll cut back, and he's a little bit farther up the elevator shaft. Oh, God. Oh. Well, hey, you had to get creative. I, I respect that. Uh, you know, I, I noticed as we were putting brand together, there were a couple of th times where you know there were a little, there was a flub here or there, and me and Kanan had to get creative with the script and kind of. <laughs> 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 
right, let's fix it. Yeah, you know, there you go. Instead of you speaking know, of brand, you 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 were you were being self-effacing earlier, but it has been such a thrill over the what the last year or so. Mm. Every time you get some, you know, your pages and you show them to me. And like, I've had a very small group of people that I could show Expendables pages to, mm -hmm. but you know, you get that. And if you care, like I, I feel, I feel like here in crowdfunding, if we don't have all of the excitement and enthusiasm, we've definitely got a super majority of it, you know, like, it, and it's just, it's, it's infectious. Yeah. Yeah. You've seen, you've seen pages of brand that have not been shown to the public. <laughs> so, uh, that's, uh, yeah, but I was always liked when I would send you, you know, some of the new art and, you know, you would always get, you'd give me an honest reaction and, and, uh, you know, obviously, uh, I think you like Kanan's work. I think you do. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Kanan is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and he's one of those people where you, you kind of broach it. You're like, Hey, so what's Kanan? And they're like, shut up. He's working for me. <laughs> Don't even ask. Well, I know he snatched him up after uh, Ethan's supposed to snatch him up once we finish Way of the Gun because I'm going to be doing a story called Brand Children of Man with Mike Barron. Uh, we're we're trying. I've, I'm trying to. Oh, we're going back and forth on the note. I got so many notes and 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 he's like, "Give it up! I'm wanting to write this thing." So I was like, "Okay," but oh, I, Mike Barron. Mike Barron's got his cleats on. Yeah, yeah. Hours a day. We're 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 on a we're on a project too. And he's he's like uh, he's like I'm I'm ready for issue two and I was like oh, hey man like uh, I'm I'm like busy for like six months he's like he's like cool dude. like uh, I just want to write it right now like he's yeah, like he pay me so whatever excited. but I'm ready to write this thing today I was like these are my characters and he was more excited than I was I was like wait a minute calm down <laughs> we go it's like well, no don't <laughs> what do you think about this person I was like oh God. I was like yeah but but uh, yeah I am very. Um, I, I'm very much looking forward because, you know, like I said, I'd like to see Kane and, and uh, Ethan Van Skyver work on Fearsome together. Uh, that is uh, in the that is supposed to be in the works, at least after we get done. And then I'm doing I'm doing at least three or four different books. I'm going to take I'm going to take brand and just, uh, you know, uh, people ask for a black and white edition. So we're going to do brand, brand black and white since I already have all those files, you know, uh, maybe do brand black and white for issue number two as well. I, I think these new pages look even better than the ones I got on book one. So I, I'm just really excited. There's, there's a lot of cool stuff coming up uh, in 2020. Uh, Kenny wants to do an art book and, and I'm um, working with another artist, uh, Demetrius Miller, you know, he's got like 45,000 followers on Instagram and he's got a, like some kind of space bounty hunter book called Mia and Grok, which, uh, uh, it looks really cool. So, I, I mean, yeah, look for that on a card press uh, later in the year. Obviously, we'll be launching Brand Way of the Gun within the next few weeks. Uh, uh, Richard, Chuck, thank you guys so much for being here today. I, I, I know you guys both have very busy schedules. And, and uh, you know, obviously, Richard, you've been here before. I don't take uh, your time for granted. And the great Chuck Dixon, uh, it has been an honor to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here today. This is fun. This is yeah, fun. This We'll do it again. Yeah, you're you're a really good interviewer. There's no uh, dead spots or anything like this. It's very easy going. Well, well there you go, guys. Uh, Mike, thanks again to the great Chuck Dixon and Richard C. Meyer for being here today. Please, please, please check out Expendables Go to Hell. It's on Indiegogo. It's smoking. I expect it to hit. 100k by Sunday at the latest. It's, I mean, it's what less than eight thousand dollars to go. I, I, I suspect uh, uh, it will be over the hill by this weekend. So, uh, congrats on that. I'm looking forward to everything you guys are working on. Uh, Chuck, when is that little eight page Catwoman thing coming out uh, that you? I don't know. It's part of a Catwoman 80th anniversary 100 page special. So I don't, I don't know. I assume, you know, June, July. I don't know. Yeah, because you know, the reason I asked it because I had Ann Nassini on last year, and she she uh, she told this interesting story about hating Captain America, and and she mentioned it in an interview, and then the Marvel editor called her and said, "Hey, I heard you hate Captain America. Why don't you write a Captain America story for me?" <laughs> and then we went with Scooby Doo. I said I hated Scooby Doo, and I got assigned the Scooby Doo story. <laughs> oh, I. I actually, uh, you're probably one of the only people that could get me to uh, uh, like a Scooby Doo story. Because, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, guys, hit that like button, share this stream out. 
uh, thank you guys so much. I am looking forward to uh, watching your uh, stream with uh, Mr. Tucci, Don Tucci, as we call him. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big, big fan of she and uh, look, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of the Tucci. So uh, I, I hope you guys have fun. I know that's going to be a, a great stream. Also, uh, come back here on this channel again tonight. I'm doing a second stream. It's our weekly podcast, The Wrestling Council. We will be here live at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. My man, Boogie Bentley, Comic Book Bob, and Yule Carter. We're going to be talking about all kinds of stuff. We're going to be talking about AEW Dynamite last night, NXT. Uh, the announcement that Bill Goldberg is coming back. He's going to be on SmackDown. Uh, we've got the WWE Super Show. There's a lot of stuff we're about to cover on tonight's episode of the Wrestling Council. So be there. Be square thank you guys so much for hanging out with us back expendables go to hell i'm out all right